and uh, obviously everyone out here knows who she is. And uh, all trumpet players know who she is because she's great. <laughs> and um, I, uh, you know, when you come out to a thing like this, you're never quite sure what's going to happen and how it's going to go. And so I just brought a bunch of, bunch of music out and sat down about half an hour ago and played through a bunch of things. And, uh, it's kind of neat from a, from a trumpet player's point of view to be able to put anything up in front of a penis and the penis just knock it off and feel like there's a communi communication that's going on right from the start, a musical communication. And uh, so uh, thank you very much, Zeta. For My pleasure. Work. That's great. I didn't know so many people were sponsoring today's event, uh, so I thank all of those who are sponsoring as well uh, for, for that uh, effort. I want today to be a fun, a fun day. Um, you know, I, I, I want this, uh, I, I know many of you have uh, arranged to uh, play. Forward to doing that. I don't know that we'll hear, we'll hear every single note of everybody's piece, but we'll give everybody a chance to play, and I'll try to make some musical comments and things like that. Um, and uh, please understand that I'm, I'm not here to be critical. Uh, I'm here to be uh, supportive and uplifting. I want this to be a time that's uplifting, a time that's musically rewarding for all. Uh, I want this also to be a time for you, one, to play, have the opportunity to play. There's nothing better than playing in front of your peers, nothing more challenging, but still nothing more rewarding than, than playing for your peers. Uh, two, I want this to be a time of communication, so if there's anything that you want to say or something that, that uh, you want to ask or share, uh, just slip up the hand and uh, we'll, we'll get that going. I, I hate the thought that I come here in a master's class. I, I never like that terminology. Uh, I just want this to be a trumpetissimo class. And that we share, everybody shares uh, information or shares thoughts that are beneficial to each other. Um, so please feel free to ask any kind of questions concerning instruments or, or you know, orchestras or East Coast versus uh, West Coast. Not that I know the answer to that. Uh, New York, uh, you know, what we do in New York Philharmonic and how that works. We're very happy to talk about any of that kind of thing. So. Boy, do we have somebody that would like to play? I will, yes, I will pepper what happens with isolated music and uh, present some things that uh, you won't hear any great works of art coming from me today, uh, but you'll hear, you'll hear uh, some fun things. But we have someone to play right after that. Yeah. Right? Great. <coughs> Darren Mulder, I'm going to be playing the first movement of the Tartini. Okay.
Darren says to me, he's nervous. I said, me too. Okay, this is uh, obviously a transcription, and, uh, and, and that's great. I'm, I'm all for doing transcriptions. A lot of people seem to, especially critics, get their nose bent out of shape about uh, the transcriptions. But um, I, I I want to I want to think in terms of, of uh, trying to take this piece of music and somehow elongate. I think what's dangerous about this piece of music is that it falls in the trap of being da ba bum da ba bum da ba bum da da bum da ba bum and it goes on for three minutes doing da ba bum bum or some variation of such. Um, and uh, if we're not careful, it can become very very short in that sense. I'd like to try to get. Uh, well, going back to the idea that it's a transcription, it's originally for fiddle, originally for violin. So I'd like us if we could sort of forget that we're trumpet and try to approach it more from a, from a musical viewpoint. For instance, then, give me an idea of where you think, starting at the start, where do you see your phrase? Where is your idea? Where, how long is your sentence here? The whole phrase starts from here and goes to the It's very much Right, right. The climax is here. Yeah. What is one way that you think that you could avoid um, sounding like a trumpet player? No, no. But I mean, how, how could we how could we avoid becoming very sort of short, episodic, putting more length on every single eighth note? Yeah, exactly. That was that was exactly one of the things that I thought of right off the bat. Just to, and and have it have it be less trumpetissimal in, in the sense of. Da da ding, da da ding, da da dum. We're always taught as trumpet players to sort of poke the sixteenths a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to turn that around and have us think more in terms of da da ding, da da ding, da da ding, da da. So that the prince, that the beats, the principal notes themselves become become more our focus, more our direction. And then if I could make each principal note within the bar, da da ding, 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 da da so that, if I, so that my, my skeleton of this thing would be It was each one sort of goes one notch, another notch, third notch, and it comes back a bit. So more or less the second notch. Second, third, fourth notch, third, fourth, fifth notch, and I take it out and bring it back down again. So that, so that I have this, this sense of, of arc on the, whole, on the whole thing. Can we just try that a little bit? A few bars. <laughs> Uh, 
um, and you can come back, and it, it just widens up the, the gamut. Otherwise, the whole piece can become very mono-oriented, mono-articulation, mono-sound, mono-concept. It's just, you know, that, that sort of way. Let's try it one more time. This is another section. This is a tough type of thing. Right, we're talking about. That are non trumpet oriented, they're fiddle oriented, right? So you gotta find some way to cheat on this thing, to make it not sound. Yeah, I would almost start the scale right on the beat. Uh, and, and sort of back off on it and have it be more of an, of an effect as opposed to a da da Okay, I hear every single note coming through. Can we give that a roll? <laughs> okay. Starting uh, maybe. How about the 30 at 30 with the pickup? Okay. Yeah. Here, do you want to give me any measures? Yeah.
shoot pictures while you're actually playing? Or huh? Do you want me to shoot pictures while you're actually playing? Yeah. Okay. And of the whole group. Okay. Is everybody okay? Okay.
many watched the game last night? Anyone watch the baseball game? Yeah? Got to be a few folks out here. Um, you look at a person like Laurel Hershiser, Hershiser, is that how you say his name? Laurel. Laurel, 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 Laurel whatever. Uh, <laughs> I, didn't watch the game. I didn't watch the game. But I watched on the news reels. When you watch that guy, you look in his eyes and you see absolute, you see that attitude, that mental attitude that says, I'm going to get this thing done. Now notice when Oral Hershiser steps up to the mound, right? ready to throw that pitch. You know, and that thing's coming, that thing's coming out. But notice here, you have to let me have my ball again. <laughs> what, did, what did he do? He didn't step up to the mound and go. Right? He didn't do that. The very first thing that he did before he ever did anything was that he did, and it was coming from back here. Right? You play golf. Go up to the ball, you don't get up to the ball, right, and go for a 300, 300 yard drive here. <laughs> it doesn't work. You gotta, there's got to be a, there's got to be a back, so you gotta breathe. First thing you gotta do is you stand up and just take some big breaths, literally, take some big breaths, go on. Let him out, that's it, let him out, do another one. You ask any of the, any of the guys that sit around me in the orchestra, if we're about to play Mahler's Fifth, or even if we're in the middle of some piece, and I start hitting <laughs> inside of me, you know what that is, that excerpt? Zarathustra, right? You hear those stupid flute players starting that. <laughs> and I'm doing exactly what you're doing. I'm sweating. I'm sweating like mad. My hands are, are all juiced up. And, and you ask anybody sitting around me, you'll, they'll tell you that I'll sit there and I'll go, Get myself breathing. I gotta breathe, right? When you start this piece, you have to have the eyes of all Hershiser. You're looking, you're looking at your object, and you're gonna drive that thing right the way through the horn. Now, you've already said to yourself, I'm gonna nail these guys. <laughs> here, 
and I got double tongues here, and I got, you know, I got awkward slurs here. You'll begin to forget about that. You'll begin to get involved in the piece of music. They'll, they'll think about those kinds of things. Um, the other thing is when you get little runs. Find yourself, when in your practice time, find yourself points. Uh, basically one of every four. And, and you've got to be rock solid in there. You've got to be right in the mic. Can we go from here? This is uh, zero after 12, the third bar. Third bar 12. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Here we go. One, two, ready, go. Now, tell me what the piano player has on beats two and four. Two. Two what? On, on, on beats two and four. Do you feel it? Play it again and listen to the piano part. One, two, ready, go. solid rhythm of eighth notes. So you've got it, your part in with those sixteenths has to be right in eighth note rhythm. And you have to know that up front so that when you're playing with her you can sense so that you don't just get into a whirlwind spin and take it out. That you really let's do it slow. Okay on that bar? One and two and three and four and one. Yeah, there you go. One and two and three and four and one. Yeah, yeah eighth notes.
living, breathing Dr. B. Right? It's got to be there. Okay, let's go 17. One, two, ready, go. <laughs> Understand the skeleton. If the skeleton's not straight, then the body's all out of whack. The skeleton's got to be straight. You have to understand that skeleton. But also, when you understand that skeleton, you play with that skeleton, it makes things line up. It forces you to play very evenly. Otherwise, you're reinforcing bad ideas. Yeah. If you're playing and things are going all over the place, you're just reinforcing that. Let's do that. 17 together. Sometimes, any, anybody ski? Snow ski out here? I don't ski, but I would think that sometimes there are times when it's a lot easier to just kind of go for the gusto than it is to be careful. Sometimes I would think going down that mountain, watching those gates and being careful, you might, you almost better to kind of go down and kind of really kind of take it through, you know? When you get into blicks like this, sometimes you better just to go, Wham! Here we go! You know? <laughs> just drive with it. If you try to be too careful with a lick like that, it can get you in more trouble. Just go for that right there. Ready? Right off the bat. Ba -da 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 -da. -da -da -da. Georgian song. 
Okay? Follow here. Contrasting nice little pieces, you can stick on a program, just uh, sort of the second half proxy set that uh, works nice. So consider those. All right, we have someone else who'd like to play. Uh, yeah, uh, Matt, you could already do the hydrant, right? Yeah. Would you like to do that now? Yeah. Do you have any, uh, while Matt's getting ready, any, any uh, comments, thoughts, words? <laughs> yes. What are your thoughts on my router? Thoughts on vibrato? I use it. <laughs> uh, thoughts on vibrato. Vibrato should be something, I think. And, and I, I, let me first of all say, I have to be careful with this. I have to be careful about my vibrato. The 
times when I use it, and then I listen to it sometimes, and go, yeah, it's, it's too much. Uh, but vibrato should be a warmth. It should be an enhancement to the sound. It should never be something that takes away. Uh, if your vibrato is getting to the point where it's changing pitch, that becomes a disturbance to me. So my, I need to watch and be careful if my vibrato doesn't get so, so wide that it's actually changing pitch color. But it should be something that just... Um, something that I use. So I would prefer that I guess as a lip vibrato, but it looks like this is what's doing it. Uh, then there are people who use the vibrato, the hand vibrato, which to me generally is, I'm going to throw this out and I don't, I don't mean it, I don't want it to sound negative, but it's more commercial players can use that type of vibrato than classical players, in my experience. Uh, and then there are people that use a, uh, actually an air vibrato, which in, again in my experience, I seem to find more wind players, more than brass players do that. Uh, so it's just, I, I'm not sure that it's, I can teach. I'm not sure that it's possible to teach how to do it. I think it's, I think it's possible to say these are ways to use vibrato, and this is how a vibrato can be used in its, in its context musically. Uh, listen and see if you can copy, and generally somebody will find out what works best for them. But again, the rule of thumb is don't let the vibrato control you. Make sure you're, you're, you're controlling your vibrato. And as I say, there are times that I have to listen to myself, and, and there are times when I'm, when I'm using it and thinking it's okay, but then hearing back and going, ah, it was too much. Generally, that's what I have to be careful for, to make sure that I, I pull it back and don't let it get out of hand. Anything else? Yeah, after, um, after playing professionally for so many years and then winning the New York audition, was it hard to prepare your uh, recording of the CD? Yes. Yeah, so was yeah. that a different mindset? <laughs> it was real hard. Yeah. I'll tell you why. Because you know you go it, it you know when we when you get these options to uh, your warm up yeah yeah great cool off <laughs> uh, when you guys get these options to go and either send a, a tape audition or a live audition to be honest with you I think I would only send a tape audition if I just couldn't come up with cash to do the, for the trip which is probably why most people do it but the hardest thing I thought to do was to put that stuff down on tape. I'd rather go play that live any day because in live performance, the little quirks and, and blips of, of live performance don't get heard because you're tied up in the emotion of the thing. You play more emotional, and, and I like that. But when I was putting it on tape, first thing I did was play emotional the way I played in live performance, and I'd listen to it and say, I, I can't let that go. It's got a little blip in it here or something, and everybody was going to be sitting there, oh, he missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> I had, to, I had to sort of back up and say, oh, I gotta get this straight here. But then I listened to it and it was it was cold. It was it was emotionless. So trying to find that balance and, and uh, so consequently <laughs> that was the hardest thing I ever did. Yeah. I mean there were a lot of takes put down to get one that was the balance of those things. And all and it's uh, it's a very cold way to do to do stuff. So I have great appreciation for people doing tape auditions at this point. Uh, my word of advice is take a live audition. I think you'd be better on all right, a little high. <laughs>
tremendous respect for me. Uh, you're going to yawn, but out of tremendous respect, you're going to yawn with your mouth closed. So please, everybody, yawn with your mouth closed. Okay, catch the idea? All right. I also, I want you to think in terms of, uh, I want you to blow on your hand. Basically, what temperature do most people feel when they blow on their hand? Hot or cold? Cold. 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 I want you to turn that air into hot air. <coughs> what do you have to do? Open up, open up your throat. In essence, you do that you want. You go on inside. You open up and try that. As if you're, as if you're very British and you've got your mouth full of marbles and you want to pull that way. No offense to my British colleagues. <laughs> uh, I'm British as well, so I can say that. It just doesn't sound like um, The other thing that I want you to think about is I want you to think about, about your throat. Is the, uh, the, 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 is the resonance of my voice. Well, what, what's the resonance of my voice like when I've got my throat up like this or as I continue to move my throat around and continue to talk and bring my throat down in this way, what happens to the resonance of the voice as I bring it down? It's more resonant. More resonant when I bring it down. Where do you think I'm going with the voice? Anyone got an idea? In the sound. If you can think about, as you play as trumpet players, you can think about keeping your head down, creating a double chin, if you will. Uh, sound verse, that's easy. <laughs> but just opening up in there. Notice the richness of the tone of the voice. It's much more rich down there than it is when I come up this way. Okay? And that same thing's going to happen. That, that's your, that one is, is where the freedom of the air comes through the horn. And as you keep your mouth open, and if you can think about blowing hot air, when you think about keeping that air hot, you'll be letting the air go through the horn a lot, a lot freer. It'll fatten up the sound, especially when you get to pieces like this, especially if you're playing on small trumpets. You've got to think about, and on a piccolo trumpet sound, a tartini, you're trying to keep that sound open that way. And in general, on all, on all the trumpets, just keeping our sound open. Very important aspect to think about. Those are things that have been helpful to me. Obviously, not everything that everybody does is helpful to all people, but if those things are helpful, put them in your back here and think about it. Um, this piece, the color of this piece to me is basically found in the fact that it marches along in four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, and yet it, in various places it will change from that, for instance around bar 52, one and two and one and two, it changes to two. So that's one thing to think about in terms of approaching this piece, four versus two. The other thing to think about it is it is People expected to hear trumpet. They expected to hear certain trumpet fanfare characteristics. That's what was common at the time. They didn't expect to hear chromaticism when they heard this piece, but they expected to hear certain trumpet characteristics. So if you threw in some chromaticism, you might fake them out and think, well, at least it's still a trumpet. Um, but right off the bat, bum, beep, bum, 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 bing, bum, bum, you're dealing with chromaticism. And they're probably pretty wowed already by that, the fact that the trumpet player could, could play this. Okay. Um, and, and, and so there's a certain aspect of that martial trumpet character there, but then being able to go into very lyrical too and change the character as well to be very, to be very singing quality. Those are things to think about. The other thing is that this piece is pretty well built. If you go through this piece and look how many times you play five pickups. One, two, three, four, five, one. One, two, three, four, five, one. One, two, three, four, five, one. The piece is built on, on five pickups all the way through. One, two, three, four, five, one. It's always built that way. One, two, three, four, five, one. Okay, there's two sixteenths tucked in there, but it's still one, two, three, four, five, one. So you're constantly thinking in terms of you can you can think of the piece always with a bar line. And you just have these bar lines keep bouncing through all the time. Or you can get away from the bar line and start thinking musically. So we're breaking out of the bar line. Breaking away from the bar line. Sorry. 
that's another story for another day. Yeah, well, that, and that's a, that's purely that's a purely technical uh, yeah. thing. That's something we have to work out this up. But there, but there really isn't any uh, uh, hard and fast rule about the, where to begin the drills. It's um, you should let the um, the flow of the melodic line be your guide. Okay. Be careful, I just say. <laughs> <laughs> no, but 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 think about that. Well, I see it. Yeah. yeah. So when you what you're saying is when you perform. I do there, because um, I like I like attention actually because that creates an image. But not yeah, there the there the work. There yeah, the work. I like those there, but the, the other trills tend to approach from the upper, and then I wouldn't necessarily do that in that place. The other thing, uh, if if you would play for me at one uh, where forty one forty thirty nine one thirty eight. Listen to the yeah, listen to the company.
Let it go that way. Try it by yourself. Just that bit. Dong, ding, dong, ding, dong. One, two, ready, go. This was a song that was famous when I was a kid, by, made famous by Cat Stevens. Morning has broken. Um, I don't know how many, uh, uh, any average campers here? Any, any? I've never been camping, but uh, I could imagine it must be, I'm asking you to tell me, it must be really exciting and neat to be out sleeping at night and to wake up in the morning and sort of smell Mountain air, smell the food, smell, you know, hear the birds chirping. We've recently moved. We've moved from a real suburban Montclair, New Jersey, to more countryfied uh, North Haven. And we live on a dead end street, and I got five acres of woods next to me. And for the first time in my life, I can, in New York at least, I can look up and I can see stars. Uh, and I can see, we're like right at the border. If you look to the east or to the southeast, you'll begin to see the light, the sky get lighter and lighter as it heads towards New York. But at where we are, it gets darker and darker until here I begin to see stars. And then as I look west, it's black. And I see a lot of stars. And, and I don't know about, you know, maybe this sounds simplistic or stupid, I don't know. But it's, it's really neat for me to come home at night and to hear the, the leaves, to hear the animals rustling through these five acres, to see the stars, and, and just, just to be aware of God's nature. Is. And actually, to take it, take you know, a stupid dog for a walk at uh, at uh, seven o'clock <laughs> or whatever it is, and uh, and and in the quietness of being on that dead end street, just having again the beauty of, of nature around it. The song here says this: it says, "Morning has broken, like the first morning. Blackbird has spoken, like the first bird. Praise for the singing, and praise for the morning. Praise for them." springing fresh from the word. The song is, is, if you will, it's a song of praise. It's, it's a beautiful song. But it's a song that says praise for the blackbird uh, that's singing his song. And it says praise for the newness of the morning. And it says just praise for everything. And, it's, and it, it then later goes on and says praise with elation. Praise every morning God's recreation of the new day. I don't know how many of you thought about this. But each and every single day that you get up is a brand new day. I have to think about this often, because I, I tend to be a depressed person, uh, believe it or not. Uh, ask my wife, she'll tell you. Um, but I have to remind myself that every morning is another opportunity with all of life's events, with whatever life has dealt me, whatever I'm facing that day, it's a new day for me to do something with it. Um, me as a Christian, Obviously, my relationship with God through Christ is something that I have to focus on that day in order to keep me very positive. Uh, I find that when I, when I just rededicate that new day and say, thank you, God, for giving me yet another day, even though what life may be dealing with me today is not what I want, but thank you for the fact that I'm here. Thank you for the blackbird that's singing. Thank you for the rustle of the trees. Thank you for the stars. Thank you for the squirrels. Thank you for my dumb dog, who's always happy. Uh, <laughs> thank you for what you've given me. Help me appreciate that. And that is something that just lifts me up each and every morning. So I hope you think about that. That's why I play this song. Not just because it's a hymn, but because it's a song that speaks to me very much to my heart and soul. <laughs>
Do you have any questions? Yeah. You stop playing. You do a lot of soft practicing. I, I do actually. I I I, I do. Um, balance is the, is the key. Uh, obviously, being an orchestral player, you know you gotta you gotta put out. And in Philharmonic, uh, there's some pretty big putting out that goes on. Uh, we have a pretty haunting low brass section, and that's a challenge to me to, to try to stay on top of that. I, I don't consider myself a person to play powerhouse kind of player, or a truly type powerhouse kind of player on some kind of way. So that's a challenge, but um, yeah, I, I like to try to keep it balanced. Obviously, my background in cornet is something that is, is very feminine. And trumpet playing can be very nasty, but I also like the kind of as well. That balance is something that I like to work with. What kind of stuff do you practice yourself? So, I mean, do you have set routines like that or not really? No, you know, I'm not a routine player. There's nothing that I do that's, that's routine. I, I like to play music, whether it's studies, whether it's solos, um, songs. I just, I like to play music. I'm not, I'm not a routine player. I've never been one that sat down and played through all of the Clark studies and stuff like that. If you heard some of my technical uh, wizardry, you'd know that. <laughs> um, but I just like music. I like you know, I just like music. You know, I Don't take that. I mean, I, obviously, I think that's a weakness of mine. And I have to be careful with my students that I make sure that I make them play some of those technical things because I know that it can be my hand as well. But I think, again, the balance is, it has to be there. I know people that are very technical oriented and can't play, can't play a tune. And you don't want to be there. Okay. Well, I got to tell you a funny story. Uh, do you know we, um, do you know Ron Anderson? Mm -hmm. um, so quite some years back, before I came out here, I was uh, working those composers' conferences in Vermont. Uh, he was there too. And um, he's the kind of guy who, uh, when it comes to just working, so he, can't, he can't find anything challenging enough, so he's been raiding the woodwind repertoire. So I remember one evening, he and I were just reading through some stuff, and then I noticed he had a copy of uh, the Resistance 21.5, which is a flute solo, understand? So I asked him what he was doing uh, for that. And so he told me that he was teaching it to his advanced students as a study in range, flexibility, equality of strength in all registers of the instrument. And then he picked up the C trumpet and he played it for me. It just blew me away. I mean, I just had, I had no idea just what a trumpet is capable of hmm. until I heard him do that. So balance is the key. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're, look, if you're looking for um, and, you know, stuff to really sink your teeth into. You could do worse than uh, raid the woodwind repertoire. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we got some pretty, pretty good stuff in the trumpet repertoire that keeps me pretty challenged. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? How much influence do you still feel in your approach to the instrument from your time in Chicago with your exposure to Hurstead and James? Uh, was that a pivotal time in your development as a player? Or oh, absolutely. I think so. Um, to hear those guys play, and again, it was it was music for art. It, it was not, and, and to see and to see Hurst play, um, he didn't approach it as a trumpet player. He approach, approached it as a, as a musician, and and good players play that way. And so for me, that was very critical. The healthiness of sound, not just volume. I mean, they did play loud. There's no doubt that that. I mean, that, that I think that's a part of where we've gone as as brass players in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we, we've gone to loud is good, and I, I'd like to sort of be instrumental in trying to counteract that, that uh, aspect of playing. Um, I like it. I like that kind of healthiness, but I think that, that this, again, you know, an orchestra is an orchestra. There's woodwinds, there's strings, and it's not just brass. When the brass comes in, we shouldn't just obliterate it. So uh, <laughs> um, I like to be balanced, but I liked the healthiness that I heard in Chicago, and I liked it. They didn't get it, they didn't get hung up sometimes. Uh, I spoke a little earlier about the rhythm and things like that, and I think that's important. I think that the solidarity of rhythm and and, uh, and the inner balance of sixteenths and eighths and quarters and all of that is important. 
but there are times with person flying that he he spent more in terms of musical coach. It didn't necessarily have to be a sixteenth. It was something that was a musical aspect. If the, if the strings kind of skidded off the sixteenth, then he would skid off the sixteenth. You know, he didn't sort of say, "No, you did it wrong, and here's a sixteenth." Da da. You know, it was it was stylish, and that's what I liked about it. And his playing could be like a hot knife through butter, or it could be just something warm and gooey. And that was I like that aspect. So that was very much a critical stage. Yeah, anything else? Not a, okay, let's, speaking of that, now that I've just said what I said about loud. Okay, let's hear the opening uh, at number 42 then, okay? You guys just want to count yourself off or do you want me to beat it off? Okay? Okay, so here's the bar before 42. One, two, three, four. says that the trumpet sounds an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? This is it, guys. Here comes the battle, you know? This is like, uh, I might not have got out of bed for that. <laughs> <laughs> cheap joke, it's a cheap joke, but I mean, you get the idea. It's gotta be, it's gotta, it's gotta happen. When you have that long note, hold that note. Your whole rhythmic body should be pulsating. If you've got to breathe, which you have to breathe, I know that, but you, you, you can't be late on your pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. It's got to be right in time. You got to catch your breath so that you're not late on the second eighths of those things, okay? But the the, the strength of this, let's just play that opening few, that opening, uh, uh, what, are, what are those ones? Uh, 30 seconds and, uh, and then long note, okay? Here we go. One, two, three, four. Listen for that boom happening. 
bum, bum, bum. It's the crucial one. That's got to be high, a little higher in this case, okay? Now, I want you to hold that note each time you get that. Don't let it go. Let's do it again. One, two, three. That's it. And you, that's where we start from, right? Don't let it go away. Then we go on to the rest of it. Here we go. Here's the bar before 42. One, two, three, four, and. We're going to go on this time. One, two, three, four, and. so forth. Um, right in time, absolutely in time. Again, the volume isn't as necessary as the feel. <coughs> you should be so proud to be leading this, this army into battle, you know? It should be like, like it wasn't the Civil War. Onward, boys, you know, let's go. It's got to have that kind of character to it, not one of fear. It should have absolute positive. <laughs> All right. Let's go to jump, da dum, da 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 dum, da dum, da 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 dum, whatever number that is. All right, I'll be the drum. We all know where we are. Dum, da dum, da 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 dum, da dum, da 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 dum, da dum. When you have the sixteenth in there, uh, whenever, oftentimes when you have, I hope you don't mind with my back here, I hope you can still hear that. When you have the sixteenth, the style eight sixteenth rhythm, contrasting against a triplet, you want to, you want to, this is what I was talking about with Hurst. He wasn't so worried about the sixteenth at this point. The sixteenth was a, a characteristic that contrasted the triplet. The important thing is the dotted note. Keep the dotted note long. And let the 16th go to the next beat. That's how I feel, as opposed to really legit, okay? Here we go. Just by yourself, ready? One, two, three, one. And you're going dum 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 dum. That's where you're going to say downbeat, okay? One and two and three and one and two. Say diminuendo, but just sort of back off a bit so that that comes through, okay? 
guys, uh, those crescendos, yeah. And the last note of the crescendo is what, an eighth note? Yes. Make it a little longer <coughs> so it's got sound to it. <coughs> Same when you have mm, da, mm, da. It's coming out, it's no different than that. I'd like it to have da, da, some sound on it. Let me just try this in the, the bars where you have those chords. One, two, bam, you know, you play there. See how I am? Yeah, third bar. Third bar up to 51, here we go. One, two. That longer. There you go. So a little longer. Yeah. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, one. That's it. Yeah, then it's got some sound, right? Then it's got guts. And otherwise it just comes out, you may as well be a drum. You know? Great. Sorry. <coughs> Any drummers in this? <laughs> <laughs> Percussion, sorry. Uh, yeah, so let's do uh, 51. Here's 51. One, two, three, mm. So forth. Where's the next piece you want? Anyone got a bit they want to play in? Got one of these cheap books that only gives you those lyrics. Um, you want to get down here to 58, guys? You're not really? Pump, 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 beep, beep, Yeah, 58, that's a good spot. Guys on the B flat, guys. Same, uh, make sure you do the diminuendo bar before, two bars before 60. Make sure you come in and out of it, okay? All right, great, thanks. Here we go. All right, there we go. 58, here's 58. One, two, go. in there, uh, if, think about it. And sometimes our high seeds tend to be flat. The first thing we do is a little more zing on the thing. That's great. Down here, you don't, just let it be comfortable. Right? Don't feel like you got to bust this into it. Just let it boom, 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 bee, ba, bee, boom. Ready? Can you do it one more time? Here we go, 58. One, two, go. Yeah. 
trunk, okay? You got the trombone, they're all rattling away down there. You can come on these long chords. You guys can come out of the way of this. The thing that I would do is uh, at 63, at 63, guys, you got a bar of, of forte, then a mezzo forte in the second bar. Really bring that down. <coughs> at 64, same thing, bring it down. Before 65, where you MF? B MF, stay out of the way. And then about a bar before 65, B one. Right, so you just pull it back uh, that way, okay? Let's go, um, that's great, let's do 64. Is that all right? One, two, go. things we did on TV with Zoo and Maita. He's, he's neat. I, I love Zoo. He's out from the line. But he used to love this bit that was coming up. Um, he, used to, he used to love this. I, used to, I love this next thing. When you go up to the high C, it just keeps coming and coming and coming. Yeah, you love it. <laughs> Who loves it, baby? But uh, I used to have, I had trouble as a, as a kid and, and get into some technical things where, where I would flinch. I'd sort of wink. I'd get this thing that would happen down here. And I really have had to work on that to try to watch and keep my facial movement out of the way. But when I get nervous, I've got to be careful that this thing doesn't kind of wink off on me. And you can, if you just wink, you can feel it down here. So it was a, an involuntary flinch that I've had to work on. But we were going through this TV thing, and I, just as I was about to go up the scale, this is when they still had cameras on the stage, and this little guy's on this little wheelie, and he goes, <laughs> <laughs> and I see this guy. <laughs> as soon as I start the scale, I see red light. No, no. And it's uh, it, it's a little. It was odd because in Chicago we always did tape TV, and this in New York does live TV. And we went up there, and Zubin's loving it. And he's going up the scale, and he's doing his Toro move, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he gets to the high C, and he goes like this. And I went, yeah! I split the high seat. I was like, oh, gosh. But I watched the TV afterwards, and I had this big schism that went down this way, you know? And it just says, you got to, it's, it's the old nerve routine. You got to grab a hold of yourself and say, I'm not going to do this now. I'm not going to do it. Mind over your nerves on these things. All right, let's play that one more time, guys. And you had a little rest now. Make sure that the accented notes are not short. They're long. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. When we get into that fugal bit, make sure that all I want to hear is bum, 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 pee, bum. I almost only want to hear those notes. I'm not interested in bum as much because someone else is already starting. Bum, 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 pee, bum, 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 pee, bum, 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 pee, bum. Right? You want to hear your figure. So if you got that lick come out, and once you've played your uh, one, two, three, four, five notes, get out. Okay? Here we go. 62. One. Uh, no, 62 or 63, what was it? 64. 64. <laughs> One, two, go. So where are we? 65? 65? One, two, go. That's it, great. But that way, each guy gets his lick in and then... 
That's another one you can bring up. So then it begins to come through that way, okay? One more time, and we'll keep going. Make sure that ta 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 ti, ta 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 ti, ta 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 tam is on. Keep it going, okay? Here we go. So 65. One, two, go. I think what's missing is uh, one, an excitement in, in their playing, uh, a conviction of something that they want to say. I think people come in and say, okay, this is New York Philharmonic. Uh, how are they going to want to hear this? And they come in and they try to be something that they're not. For whatever reason, I don't know. I would like someone to come in and play the trumpet, come in and tell me a story, come in and just be absolutely Vincent and what you're doing. Uh, and then we'll find out whether you can be shaped. But what's happening is people are coming in and they're trying to be something they're not, or they're coming in with no conviction at all, and it's coming out very cold and very stale, and, and there's no music happening. There's no music happening. I don't care if you come in and play a pile of wrong notes. If I hear music, I'll give you a second chance to, to fix those wrong notes. Obviously, if there's wrong notes that keep coming, that's a problem. But it, I'd rather you come out and make a mistake, but you're telling me the greatest story ever told. And, uh, and then, you know, do it that way. I think the reasons for that, I think we hear a lot of recordings. I think there's a certain fear that things have to be absolutely perfect, and in order to be perfect, I'd better be safe. Uh, no, I, I'd rather go for the gusto on something. So I think that's one element that's really missing, is a conviction, a musical conviction on the inside that needs to come out. Uh, the other thing that I think is missing is sound, depth of sound. I think trumpet players are getting very edgy 
very, I think, overblown a lot of things. And sounds get very, wham. You're gonna sound like you come from the Midwest. And I, I want to sound more that way. And, and basically what that is, is a, is a usage of air, taking air in and getting it out and opening up and filling the horn that way. That openness that we talked about. Those are things that I think are two crucial things for me uh, that, that tend not to be happening. Now I know that there are lots of reasons why. I know, I know auditions are sterile. They're hard things to do, I understand that. Uh, uh, I will tell you this, in both of my, I, unfortunately I only ever have to take two auditions. <laughs> in both of my auditions, I laid down some of the biggest faux parts. I played, um, I auditioned at Chicago. You, know, you see Schulte, you see Hearst out there, and they said play uh, Leonora Paul. I'd always played my Leonora Calls on the B flat. I was a B flat player. And I did what I just said. I said, all right, in Chicago, they want to hear everything on C trumpet. Because somebody in, at school had said C trumpet. So I practiced all my licks on C trumpet. I didn't practice the, the uh, Leonora because it's a piece of cake. You know, it's no big deal. I know how to play that. So I didn't practice that so much. So I picked up my C trumpet and I played it as if I was playing B flat trumpet. So I was a complete tone out. And I played through the whole thing, and as I'm playing the thing, thinking I'm really nailing this thing, I see Schulte going. And first it's going. And this conversation taking place, and at the end of it, Hersa says, uh, look at your trumpet. <laughs> but I laid down this big faux pas. I played the whole thing in the wrong transposition. And, and I went back and played it again, and I'm sure it shook me. I mean, I don't remember much after that, but. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, I won the job, right? I came to New York, and uh, you know, you play some box stuff, and you play some uh, uh, pictures at an exhibition, and something we've done where I've gone from, I played something on a B-flat piccolo, and then they asked for pictures at an exhibition. And when I put it up, they're also telling me that when we play Schmuel, uh, the way we do it in New York is that the two trumpet play, first and second play this piece together. And I'm thinking, I don't want to do this first and second. I want to do this by myself. And so I wasn't paying attention. So I put just the B flat side up, and I wasn't in the right, on the right horn. And I started into this Schmuel. And he was going to play, and he goes, and I'm thinking, this guy's trying to mess me up. <laughs> First trumpet player I had. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and it took the second trumpet player to say, look at your horn. So I'd done it again. And I thought that was it, I'd gone. So two big faux parts, and yet I won both of those editions. So what does it say? Make music. Don't worry about the notes. You'll make it goofy. So what? It's OK. And we as a committee are very conscious of that. And if someone just doesn't play well, do it again. Or if they say, can I do it? Absolutely. Play it again. Play it again. We want you to make music. So those are the things for me that are important. Can I just say something? Hmm. Um, I, I know the way he's saying this. It's true from personal experience, because I went to New York Philharmonic audition, and I played. And I and my teeth were going through a big thing, and some of you guys know me and know that uh, I was having problems with my teeth moving a lot. And I, I took that audition a few years back, and I was I think it's just watch, I figured myself it's one round. I can go out there and play for ten minutes. At least I can play for ten minutes. And I played Alpine Symphony, and I clammed the high C sharp or whatever the heck it is, which normally I, I think I wouldn't hit. And they still invited me back. So uh, you treat your word. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, you know, one of our um, uh, horn players, who's now retired, used to say to his students, if you're going to clap, do it with such authority that everybody will think you meant to do it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, in regards to auditioning, I know that, uh, or even playing in the orchestra these days, a lot of, at least people um, on this coast, uh, get a particular key trumpet to play a particular excerpt. And I know, uh, also I, I went to New York, and when you do the audition, um, at least in the first round, they said, bring your C trumpet only. That's all you'll need. And I'm just wondering, if do you suggest that uh, when somebody's preparing for an audition, stick with 
a sleep trumpet, or is there real flexibility? You know, you have the authority to say, I would really like to bring my D or my B flat or whatever else you might need. Um, probably what happened there, I don't know what audition you came to, but um, yeah, we don't want to we don't want to tell you what instrument to play things on. And, and you know, in our effort to be fair and let everybody play, you know, you're looking at 150 players that are going to come and take time out of my life. <laughs> you know, I could go through that thing and, and whittle it down to 20 players uh, based on word of mouth or some kind of abstract thing that can resonate. But we try to be fair and let anybody play. And so our experience was that if there may have been something on that that you had to play, uh, where people were just taking too much time, there was too much dead time in switching the horns. And so it might have gotten to the point in that audition, I don't remember exactly where, I simply said, this is basic stuff, I want everybody just to play C trumpet, or something like that. Um, no, I don't want, my personal feeling is, um, there's really very little in the repertoire that can't be played on C trumpet. That's my personal opinion. I think, quite honestly, that we, as trumpet players, have gotten too cushy about playing s different key trumpets with different words. <coughs> That's a personal opinion. I understand that. Uh, and I have to be sensitive to that. Um, but basically, uh, if, if you were really absolute about wanting to play Petrushka on a Q trumpet or something, um, then, then that's up to you. But it's a personal opinion. I would, I would go for this. I think it's better for people to work on a leg, work it out. It may be a little harder, but uh, save, save the other horn for a little later when you get in your 50s and 60s and you need a little help. Yeah. Then, then I would go that route. That's my opinion. Anything else? Yes? What's some of your favorite music you like to listen to? Uh, light rock. <laughs> uh, ask my wife, do I listen to much orchestra stuff at home? Not much. I can't. I, I go, I get fried on it at work, so if I go home, I listen to stuff other than classical. Now, that's not to say that I might not listen to something that, as a study, uh, and that's not to say that when I go on vacation, I don't get, like, I gotta hear it. Usually about the second, third week of vacation, I find a classical music station because I'm, I'm kind of aching at that point to get back to it. But you got to balance out your life, at least I do. I, I have to. So I, I like uh, rock and roll. I play in rock and roll bands. That's what I listen to. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anything else? Brass banding. I'm a, I'm a brass band. I, I, like, I like good brass band. Good celebration on it. That's something I like too. Anything else? Yeah. How about uh, switching concepts since you, you I think I'm a cornet player, honestly. I was brought up cornet. I have a cornet concept in my ear. Uh, I think I like to start kids. If the kids are starting to play, I would like everyone, everyone to start their experience on cornet. What is a cornet concept? Well, let me say this. Your first blat that you make on a cornet is going to sound more mellow than the first blat on the trumpet. That's, that's the first thing. So your initial oral concept is it's darker. Okay? So that begins to that begins to set oral things up in here that are going to be lifetime oriented. Next thing is that cornet, especially in a brass band situation, is much more feminine in its approach. Uh, it's not so masculine. Does that make sense when I say something like that? That it's, it's, it's lighter. It's easier. It's back this way. Um, and so that color of instrument plus that femininity of approach is, a, is another whole concept. Now, the, then you get into various schools of cornet, British school versus American school, and all this kind of stuff. And, and the, I'm not really interested in that. There, there are different things. And you can hear them by listening to a British brass band or to an American Salvation Army band. They're very different in the cornet approach. But nonetheless, the sound is somewhat similar. Um, so now, uh, it was hard for me to go to Juilliard and after being brought up in that, become a much more masculine, aggressive trumpet player. And I don't think I've ever really mastered that. Like I said earlier, I'm not the kind of bulls that some of the great trumpet players, American trumpet players have been. But I think who I am is a mixture of these two things. And, uh, and that may be, you know, 
know, something that's attributed to a certain amount of my success and, and things like that. So I don't see myself as a real American Berbore or trumpet player or as a real feminine uh, cornet player anymore. I'm something in the middle. And I think the beauty is that you can bring the pluses of both sides to the other side. I can bring the cornetti approach to Mall of Fit and some of the lyrical things. Finds it I can bring that cornetti approach in there. And then on some of the cornet that I can bring some of the trumpet approach to that and, and combine that across. So that's a little bit of who I am. A couple more, and then we'll close. Just uh, in terms of uh, playing the tune, uh, earlier you spoke of using a, an alternate pin with an IC to bring it up. Uh, how much do you say you can get away with? For instance, uh, say you have a middle D and it's a mild flat. What matters to you, what matters to you, and how comfortable you are. Can, I mean, obviously, pitch is, is a criteria, but sound is a criteria too. So, so you as the individual is going to balance it out and say, you know, yeah, I can do this, or maybe I'm better just to play the first and really, and really goose it up a bit. Would it be better not to use an alternate No, I, I would, I would, I'm a proponent of using alternate fingers, especially on on, on C trumpets, because it, that's there's some quirky things to C trumpets. So I'm a proponent of doing that. I, I think people need to be comfortable with using alternate fingers. So I, I encourage that usage. But then I think it's up to the individual to sort of balance that out. You know, it's as wrong to use all alternate fingers as it is to be hard nosed and say, oh, I'll never use an alternate finger. Both of those sides are out of whack. Something in the middle that says, well, here's an option that I have, but you know, that yeah, doesn't quite work. I don't like the color of that. So let me go back here and I'm gonna have to do something here. The beauty of, I think, being brought up in cornet was, especially the old cornets, so they didn't play in tune. Anything you played, you were fiddling around with. And, uh, and so I think that was something that, that I used. You'll notice when I play, I very rarely kick anything, but bees or things like that, I'll, I often just kind of goose it where it needs to go. And I think that's something that's important, too. That come, you get a lot of that approach. That's why you practice your stamp stuff with uh, the, the, the bends, you know. Yeah, that idea, it's doing two things. One, it's opening out your aperture, helping to kind of get that darkness of sound in there. Two, it's, it's creating the flexibility in here to be able to, you know, control things. No horn is perfect. You're going to have to adjust it somehow. Your fingers, your lips, whatever. And then you have to decide what combination of that's going to work, what's going to sound right and what's not. Okay? Another one. If you have several uh, physically difficult things to do in a week, how do you recover between? Uh, um, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I don't always know that. Sometimes you get stuck in a situation. I'm, I'm a bit in that situation now. I go from here, having done some of this stuff, to play a full recital, uh, which has got a lot of piccolo playing on it, to a couple of days later doing the home with the symphony. And then the second piece on, on the program's got a trumpet and a trumpet piece, and I got this screaming pit part. So I'm kind of looking at that next week and saying, why did I do this? Uh, um, I just did last, about a year ago, I did a thing in, in Leipzig where the first week with the Gewein House Orchestra I did the Brandenburg, and the second week I did Joseph Turner's concerto. Seemed like a great idea when I booked it. It was not a good idea when I was there. Because uh, in the middle I had a few days to go from Brandenburg trumpet control and his part. So how do you do it? <laughs> sometimes with nothing but prayer. Uh, and sometimes by just saying, all right, now just relax here. Let's not lose my head. I'll just slowly go through something. Back down. Don't try to jam something. But back off. Play, you know, if I've gone from the pick to the big horn, just play lightly and loose. And just try to relax it out that way. Uh, in my situation for next week, I've got to play the big horn. I've got to do more quick changes in, it, in the practice. I've got to play big horn, small horn, big horn, small horn, big horn, small horn. In the practice, I've got to go back and forth so that I'm developing both things. So I'm not getting stuck in one area. This next week, I've got to do both things. So, so those are different ways that I would approach it. Does that make sense? I understood what I said. All right, we're going to finish with Napoli. Um, I like playing the cornet repertoire on the play. So we'll, we'll do that. Phil? Yes. Could you mention about the Yes. 
I think you got some uh, some little flyers or something. I think on, on the seat. Um, why I'm here basically is, is for the Salvation <coughs> Army to uh, to play uh, a program with my wife. Uh, this this nice lady here turning pages is my wife. Church. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the church is. Let's see. Found this little flyer here. Um, First Church of the Nazarene in Pasadena on Sierra Madre Boulevard. Uh, you can see that there's a, uh, a mime artist uh, who's there. It's it should be a really nice program with the uh, Susan Pacific uh, Bell Canto Choir, and Pasadena Salvation Army Tabernacle Band. Uh, and a drama group. It should be a nice event, so feel free to, to come by. We invite you to that, and it will, it'll be a very pleasant, uh, uplifting kind of program. So, we invite you to come here then. Okay.
that's amazing. Nothing about being on the spot here. She's nailing this thing. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's a tough piece, I tell you. I have never, ever performed this piece. Um, just because it's, one, it's hard. It's hard to grasp it. It's hard to have a piece in play. Uh, and the whole ending thing there. You, you threw me for a loop because I didn't know what to expect that she was playing it perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't ready for that. Uh, that, that was great. It's, uh, that, was the, you know, that was the first thing that I ever played was a sonata when I was in high school. That's tremendous. Yes, you are. So uh, I think, uh, again, we should say a big, big thank you. I personally, I, I think on behalf of everyone here, would like to certainly once again thank Phil for this, this wonderful class. And I, I, I'd like again to thank the the people who sponsored it, the School of Music here at USC, School of Music at Cal State Fullerton, uh, the Yamaha Corporation, and Bob Malone's Branch Technology for making this event possible. So once again, Phil, thank you. Thank you.